In this portion of our Worldviews and Values class, we're going to look at a work by the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a great social theorist and thinker who wrote in French but was not actually from France originally. And the work that we're going to look at is called The Discourse on the Origin of Inequalities Among Human Beings. Sometimes the last part is translated as humanity or among men. Any of them are perfectly good translations. Now, as usual, with this sort of introductory video, we're going to try to cover three main things to help you get ready to, to plow into this work. One thing that we're going to talk about is the literary genre of this work and what you should be looking out for because of that. Another thing that we'll talk about that's very important, I think, for this work is historical context, situating Rousseau and his ideas and this particular text within a historical milieu and even moment. And then the last thing that we'll talk about are some of the key themes in outline that you should be paying particular attention to. What does it help to know about the genre of the discourse on inequality? So first off, we're looking at something that's called the discourse. And in philosophy, that's a word that gets used for some sort of systematic investigation, not necessarily trying to you know, completely go through a topic or a matter in an exhaustive, comprehensive manner, but certainly focusing in on particularly important aspects of it. And here the discourse is on inequality. So Rousseau wants to explain the nature and the development of inequality. You can think of this as an extended essay. Uh, it's ha it has one very long, um, many parts, all put together kind of argument going on, and, and you have to do a bit of work in order to reconstruct the entire structure of the work and see the argument for what it is. But there is a coherent narrative or argument underlying this whole thing. Now, one other thing that's important to think about, what is he trying to do in this? When you're first reading it, you might say, well, he, he's trying to do what we nowadays call history or anthropology or ethnography. And Rousseau isn't exactly making claims that, you know, his, the story that he's telling is historically accurate in every single case that it covers every single civilization. He's trying to suggest to us that what we take for granted in civilization the ideas, the technology, the environment, the, the social relations that to us seem quite natural, aren't really natural, that they are the products of a historical development, a, a long process of development. So what he's doing is he's reconstructing a narrative of, you can call it progress if you want, um, development is probably a better word for it because progress often has this, this sense of being, you know, from better to better to better. And he's carrying out what we call a genealogical account. He's trying to say that we can trace out the origins in general, not, not into great specificity, but in general, of some of the things that in the present, or at least in the present of the 18th century that he's writing, we take as being just, you know, going without saying or... or things that are obviously the case. So a genealogical account is, is trying to trace things back to their genesis, to their origin, and then follow out the process to show that things didn't necessarily have to go the way that they did. Certainly not when we get down to the level of particulars. So Rousseau is, is aiming at, at showing the development of the human being from our animal origins, uh, although a little bit different than other animals in certain respects, all the way up to the, the heights of civilization. Now, he's also trying to make a point through this. He's carrying out evaluations. That's another key term to think about. He's trying to say that there were certain stages of development, and he's wondering whether we're actually better off through all of these processes that we've gone through or whether human beings were better off in earlier stages. And you're going to see him making some arguments about, uh, the, you know, how this has gone. He'll actually say that 
with civilization, a lot of bad things came, some really good things came, but the bad things tend to outweigh the good. So that's, that's the, the master argument there. He is engaging some other previous theorists, in particular Thomas Hobbes, although he also brings up a couple other people like uh, John Locke and Puffendorf and, and a few other people as well. The, the main, if there's only one person to think about that you'd want to read in order to understand some of what he's reacting against, I think it would be Thomas Hobbes and you would want to read Leviathan because that was his most influential work. Now there's other things to tell you about this work that I think help to put it into a bit of context as well. And now we're starting to get a little bit closer to historical context. This was in fact a um, essay that was submitted to a prize competition that we still have these sort of competitions going on today by the way and academies and learned journals in what we call the republic of letters would every once in a while offer a prize and they would say here's a question we want everybody to write an essay in response to this and the best essay will get a prize you know some money and you'll get known this will be a way in which you acquire a reputation as a thinker as an author and we'll also publish your piece in our our, um, our journal so rousseau had done this before with his discourse on the arts and sciences in the same uh, uh contest He's doing this a little bit later, four years later, with the, or the Discourse on the Origin of Inequality. And it was the Academy of Dijon. Dijon is a city in France. They had a, a university there, and the Academy is, is uh, offering this prize. And if you, if you won, you would be published in the Mercure de France, which was a, a great um, prestigious journal at that time. So Rousseau writes this piece not just to, you know, publish it somewhere, not just because he's interested in this, but because it's occasioned. Somebody asks a question about the origin of inequality and how that has to do with natural law. And so this is Rousseau's answer to that. We can read it on, on our own without having to think about these sorts of background things, but it's kind of useful to know that. And it, it kind of fits into Rousseau's larger project. So if you were going to go on and read more Rousseau, you would want to read his other discourse, the Discourse on the Arts and Sciences, and you would definitely want to read the work, The Social Contract, which he is, is referencing the idea of in, in this work. Um, some other works by Rousseau that probably would be germane to this would be the, the Emile, which has to do with the notion of education, and also Rousseau's Confessions, which, which give you an idea about his development as an author. There's a lot to say about the historical context that this work finds itself within. We're now midway into the period that we call modernity. Um, we're just decades away from the French Revolution, uh, the somewhat earlier and uh, somewhat less earth-shaking American Revolution as well. Um, it's a time of great change. It's also a time of massive, massive inequalities and inefficiencies in this developing European civilization. So there's a number of different points that we want to run through very quickly just to give you kind of a, a panoramic view of the situation in which Rousseau is writing and also the situation that he is going to be influencing. So these, we're, we're, we're talking about somebody who is writing in the matrix of a highly developed highly evolved and at the same time in many ways still overlaid on, on primitive bases European society. And he's writing in French at the time when if you want to talk about two main rivals for the culture of Europe for the dominant power not only economically and um, militarily, but in terms of just, you know, what we nowadays call soft power, cultural power, it would be England and France. And Rousseau lived in both of those places. He didn't understand English, um, didn't have a good time in England, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but he, he had a massive role within these cultures, in part because he is a cultural critic. He is looking at these cultures almost as an outsider, almost as somebody 
who doesn't identify with them, but who um, can see what's going on in them better than the people who are living in them and can bring to light their inconsistencies and their flaws. So we have a, a culture that's able to generate immense wealth, but the wealth is not being shared um, fairly or you know, according to any sort of norms of equality. Opportunities are open you know, to, to those who can seize them, and the vast majority of people are living in states of, of quite miserable conditions. So we have a, a, a time of great contradictions and great opportunities. I think that you could talk about three E's that, that sort of succeed each other and interpenetrate with each other that also tinge this, this civilization. On the one hand, we're talking about an era of exploration. The Europeans, because of their possession of, uh, you know, new techniques of navigation, new shipbuilding, um, the, the economic wherewithal to put, you know, expeditions out there, they had by now begun to circumnavigate the, the entire globe and start to fill in a lot of blank spaces on the maps. And this, you know, resulted in a lot of uh, conflicts and clashes between European uh, settlers or colonists or explorers or even conquistadors and native peoples, indigenous peoples uh, throughout the world that they were running into, and also the older civilizations that, that you know, the, the original explorers were trying to reach, like in India and China. Um, it was a time in which Europeans were becoming more and more dominant, um, in part because of their, their technology, in part because of their greatly increasing numbers, which, which was a factor of technology as well. Um, disease played a part in that. There were areas which became rapidly depopulated in the Americas because of their exposure to European illnesses that Europeans had, Europeans and Asians had resistance to. So the, the age of exploration leads into an age of exploitation. And the Europeans, with some exceptions, some very important exceptions, didn't treat indigenous peoples very well. Um, they superimposed, you know, what they conceived of as natural European norms onto them, um, sometimes with some success, sometimes not. There were a lot of prospects, you know, of colonization and trying to extract resources from, from lands and from people. So there's a lot of exploitation going on. The, you know, um, hierarchy or class system becomes established in many areas that, that hadn't had that before, or which had other kinds of societies, which were uh, quite developed and had um, quite strong hierarchies as well, but they were replaced by, by Europeans um, and their successors. It was also a time of empire. So we're talking about you know, a French empire and a British empire, you know, vast holdings all, all over the places, uh, an expansion going on. Now, um, like I said, there were some great inequalities running throughout this society, and, and we can think of inequalities of just every sort of, of manner, inequalities of wealth, inequalities of opportunity, inequalities of education. Most people didn't have any access to education at that time. Um, property, power, rank. Some of these uh, inequalities were also seen as, on the one hand, by those who possessed them, being you know, just part of the natural order or the way things should be, and by people who were suffering under them as being totally arbitrary, being unfair, having no good reason to be there. So you have a lot of social conflict and social tension going on within this society. Um, there were a lot of people carrying out investigations in, in uh, philosophy and also in what we would nowadays call anthropology or ethnography, trying to think about how the situation of human beings had gone from, you know, whatever the original state of human beings was to the condition that we're in today. They were very interested in developmental, um, sort of quasi-historical reconstructions 
of the, the ongoing progress of human beings. Some people were thinking about this in religious manners, but um, because of the rise of modern science and because there was this tendency to explain things less and less in terms of religion and more and more in terms of, you know, uh, what we could observe empirically or what we could theorize with the, the human mind, um, there's a greater tendency to want to, to try to strip those elements away and say, no, we should begin from a, a naturalistic perspective. We should try to understand the human being in their development all the way up to the present time, coming from animal origins all the way to civilized human beings. And Rousseau is writing in a context where other people have been doing this. He thinks he can do uh, one better on them. So another thing that we can talk about in terms of historical context is, particularly for Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the contrast between Geneva, the town that he is growing up in, a Swiss canton, a essentially city-state, um, which is uh, originally fairly democratic, although it's also, um, you know, run by, by, by what we would nowadays see as pretty hardcore uh, religious uh, elements, the Calvinists, um, and the contrast between Geneva and Paris. Rousseau is going to grow up in Geneva, so, you know, we, we see a similar thing to, like, what happens when the small town person goes to the great metropolis, and they lose some of their naivete, and they start to say, um, you know, the, those small town people, they were kind of restricted in their ideas and attitudes, but then after a while they start to say, you know, there was a lot of stuff that I kind of liked about the small town that's just not there in the big city. The big city is kind of soulless, heartless. It takes people in and grinds them up, chews them up, spits them out, uses them. So Rousseau is going to be critical, actually, of, of both of these poles. Um, but it's something worth, worth keeping in mind. If you're going to do any further research in him, you'll see how important these, these conceptions are. Now, one of the other things that I really want to talk about is the intellectual development within the European sphere, which also extends to the Americas in, in certain respects as well. We can speak of what, we, what they like to call back then a republic of letters. And what we mean there is not just letters circulating back and forth as if everybody was emailing each other using paper. Epist epistolary literature, you know, um, the, the kind of literature that, that comes from writing letters to people was an important element of that. We see, for example, Montesquieu with his Persian letters or Voltaire's letters playing an important role. But what we're talking about is the growth of an intellectual class within society, largely among the growing bourgeoisie, the upper middle class, the property owners, the people who had businesses, that sort of thing, uh, and the middle class. Now, there were a lot of different elements to this. Um, some people talk about this, as, like uh, Jürgen Habermas talks about the development of a public sphere. The idea was that instead of the, the aristocrats, the, the nobles, uh, or, or the clergy essentially dominating the intellectual scene, it now becomes those who are willing to communicate through writing, those who will engage each other, those who read each other's writing, who read the latest reviews, who read the latest journals. And there were a number of different supports to this. Some of it was face-to-face -face in what they called salons, um, you know, and in the coffee houses, in, in the cafes. All of this is, is part of the environment that Rousseau is quite at home in, in many respects. A guy like Rousseau probably... In, in, in some ways, could not have made it as big without that, that sounding board of the Republic of Letters within which his works could, could reverberate. And it offers him the opportunities to come into contact with and even develop friendships 
with some very important thinkers like uh, Diderot, who invites him along with D'Alembert to work on the encyclopedia, one of the very first encyclopedia projects. Um, also David Hume, the, the Scottish philosopher, um, who, who um, also is known for his literary and historical works at that time, who brings Rousseau over to England for a while until Rousseau gets a little nuts, uh, accuses David Hume of plotting against him, and uh, basically turns a guy who is one of the most sanguine and, and easy to get along with people uh, in the world into somebody who says, you've got to get out of here. But th the point is, Rousseau is able to come into contact with these, these brilliant thinkers. Um, he's also able to get the notice of people who will criticize him, like Voltaire. And, you know, they say there's no, um, there's no bad publicity. I think in the sense of, you know, of uh, the kind of work that Rousseau is doing, that's probably a true thing. The more that people would criticize him, the more that people would read him. Rousseau, along with some of these other people, became what we can call some of the banned bestsellers of that era. Because at the same time as, as conceptions of freedom and, and uh, you know, getting away from old forms of, of government and, and thinking and approaches to the world and to the human person that are rooted in tradition or rooted in superstition, along with all that comes a, a clamping down by the powers that be on revolutionary thought. And Rousseau really is a revolutionary thinker. Um, we should mention that one of the, the major effects of Rousseau's work is, in fact, the French Revolution. It, it would be a mistake to attribute it entirely to Rousseau, but he certainly it plays a major role in fanning the intellectual flames that will ex, you know, exploit the, the, the inequalities and the great miseries of human being to eventually produce a revolution that says... We're not going to just try to reform things. We're going to sweep things away and begin on totally new grounds. Rousseau is one of these people who is called a philosopher, and a lot of the, the revolutionaries took uh, him as, as being a hero. Um, because of his emphasis on human beings in the state of nature, on the role that compassion or sympathy would play, and on primitive societies, Rousseau is also to be credited for helping to spur the growing Romantic movement as well in literature, in philosophy, and also even in, in music. He was a, a person who wrote some musical pieces and had a great interest in, in music as well. So you notice that again, as with most of the figures that we're reading, not only is Rousseau being formed by and, and, and assuming his importance because of the context that he's in, he's also going to be steering it to a certain degree as well. What are some of the key ideas, some of the key concepts that you should be on the lookout for as we go through this work? So there's quite a few of them. One of these is the state of nature. And Rousseau will actually talk about a primitive state of nature, which he thinks is quite different than the state of nature as depicted by other social theorists, and then a corrupt state of nature that he thinks answers to what people like Hobbes are, are talking about. So that's going to be an important thing to pay attention to. Um, moving past the state of nature, we get to another key idea, which is that of primitive civilizations, or as he's going to call them, savage or barbarian um, civilizations or cultures. And he thinks that this is one important stage of development on the way to human civilizations of, of the modern European kind. So a third important thing to think about, a third important idea, would be the state of civilized society. Uh, the kind of so society that they lived in in the 18th century and which we live in a successor society to today, which I think Rousseau would say we, we have a lot of the same uh, issues and problems going on. Now, another thing that's key to this, that allows you to actually move from one to the other, is this notion of self-improvement or 
progress or development as being integral to the human being. Another word that you'll use, uh, that you'll see used for this is uh, human perfection or uh, becoming more and more perfect in older literature. And the idea that Rousseau has is that this is something that sets us apart from the other animals. And we do this partly by changing ourselves, but also by surrounding ourselves with all kinds of technology and culture and social relations. Another thing that he's going to talk about that's very important, a type of technology that we often don't think of as technology, is language. He will spend quite a bit of time discussing the origins of language um, and, and the role that language plays in allowing us to articulate ideas, to form new conceptions, to become more and more what human beings look like today. Um, another key idea that you'll want to pay close attention to. Rousseau thinks that human beings are not fundamentally different from the animals by having ideas or being able to think, but by developing that. And, but that actually happens through development of the passions. The emotions will play an incredibly important role. The emotions, the desires, our whole panoply of affectivity plays an important role in how we think about things for Rousseau. Now, one of the most important ones that he's going to talk about and really stress here, something that's available to human beings in the state of nature but becomes somewhat uh, anemic in civilized society, is what he calls compassion. Another word for this that was very popular at the time was sympathy. Rousseau thinks that we have an instinctive compassion for other human beings, uh, we, we don't want them to suffer, we don't want them to be threatened, we want to take care of those who are vulnerable, but that, that's something that although it's instinctual to us, we can, we can wipe out, and he thinks that civilization actually does quite a number on us in expunging that from, from our, our way of being. Um, another key idea that, that comes along is that of property and of law as being a protector of property primarily. Now that brings us to the notion of inequality. And this entire discourse is supposed to be tracing out the development of inequality. Where did it come from? How did it develop? How did it become worse and worse and worse? And Rousseau is going to diagnose a number of different causes and a number of different effects that inequality has in order for us to, to understand uh, it's, it's, uh, it's workings. Um, another key idea that you should pay attention to, the incredible transformative role of agriculture and metallurgy in taking us from primitive societies that are based around uh, what he's calling morality and moving us towards civilizations that are based on notions of property and law. Um, the very understanding of, of morality as something that arises in primitive societies out of the human tendency to compare ourselves with others once we've become settled uh, in, in abodes with them, in, in a way of life, a shared way of life. Um, the, the notion of primitive morality or, or of codes of morality is something that's, that's very important. Um, finally, we have this notion of social contract, which he's not going to explore in great detail here, but does play a role in, in his thinking. The, the basic idea be, behind social contract is that human beings in a society are all in one sort of fundamental basic agreement that is expressed in a general will, not the will of one person, but the will of the whole society. And that will, you know, sort of specifies how we ought to behave towards each other. The very last thing that this leads to, which is going to spur even more and more inequality in society, is what he calls magistracy, or we can call it government. And Rousseau's idea is that... Um, once we're in a civilized society and we have laws and we have a social contract, we need some sort of agency which will make sure that the contract is actually followed. Unfortunately, that agency tends to attract more and more power to itself. 
it, it becomes, instead of being a servant of the people, it becomes the people's master and imposes servitude upon them. And this leads to inequalities that, that tend to be perpetuated, inequalities of wealth, inequalities of power, inequalities of prestige, inequalities of opportunity, inequalities of all different sorts. And so that is inherent in his notion of what he calls magistracy. So those are the key ideas. Now I think you're ready to dig into the text.